Hi everyone. So this video is on uh, introducing the main mechanism through which we train um, uh, current state-of-the-art deep neural networks. So before, which is gradient-based learning. So before we get to that, let's recap how like the, the structure of the components of a, of a deep neural network. And uh, as we said in this course, we will always uh, focus on classifiers just for simplicity, but uh, the concepts will transfer even to regression problems. So you have an input vector X and X has multiple features. So let's say you have X1, X2 and X3. So let's say you have three, vect uh, three features for the input, right? Now, this input transfers through weights of the first layer to neurons of the first layer. And then these neurons are followed by nonlinear activation functions, like the, remember the rectified linear unit simple example uh, that we had for the XOR uh, function, uh, for the XOR problem. And then we have another layer of weights, right? And then nonlinear activations, right? And so on. And then we have output units. Right? So we represent by theta all the model parameters, which includes the weights in the first layer, the weights in the second layer. And if there are any parameters that define the nonlinear activations. Right? So all these parameters, we represent them by a set that we call theta. So you have the input vector x, you have the model parameters theta, and then the model computes f theta of x, right, at the output. So this is f theta of x. f, maybe the input has three units, f could have five units. Right, so the, these two numbers, the dimensionality of the input and the dimensionality of f don't have to be the same. And then based on f theta, we compute the cost, right? So we compute cost j theta, j, sorry, uh, of f theta of x and y. So y is that row labeled? Right, so in a classification function, I'm given uh, examples of input vectors along with the true labels. And then while I'm training, I compute for each input vector through the current setting of the model parameters, the value of f theta. And then I compute the cost in terms of the value of the output units and the true labels. Right, so the true labels are, are given during training. And then we update theta to minimize j. Now this j function is a cost functional, right? And uh, we call it functional because it's a function of a function, right? So f is a function in x, and then j is a function in f. So j, the accurate way to call it, for simplicity, we just say the cost function, but what it really is, is a functional because j is a function of the function that the model computes. So for every function that the model computes, that is defined by the model parameters theta, right? So for every setting of the model parameters, we obtain a different function f, right? And then for every different function f, we have a cost j associated with this function, right? So then we compute j, and then we update theta to minimize j. So we update theta such that the new f that's computed out of the new theta result in a lesser value of the cost function LJ, right? So, so this is the general paradigm. Now, gradient-based learning refers to a specific way or a specific strategy of updating this theta to minimize J, which is basically using the first derivative information or the gradient of J with respect to theta to update the parameters. So the gradient is a vector of the partial derivatives of j with respect to theta. So for example, if 
let's say I have 100 values for the theta. So my model has 100 parameters. Then the gradient would basically be partial j partial theta 1, the first parameter, down to partial j partial theta 100. Right? And then the theta new or the new value or the new setting of the parameters equal theta old minus epsilon times the gradient of j with respect to theta. And this epsilon, we call it the learning rate. Right? So this is the step by which we move in the direction of the gradient to update the parameters. So as a simple example, let's take this example. So you have, you start, this is the starting point. The gradient will tell you to move in this direction. So you move with a certain step defined by epsilon, and then you move to this new point, and then you take another step, you move to this new point, another step, you move to this new point, and then here at the minimum point, the gradient will tell you to never move. So the gradient will be zero, right? <clears throat> and uh, this will happen not only for this example, but for any convex function, the gradient will be zero at the minimum point. Now the problem is that if our function is not convex, then it could have local minima, right? So we could get stuck in local minima, right? So the problem becomes non-trivial, right? For non-convex functions. How to navigate the cost function in the parameter space, right? through gradient-based learning, right? So imagine you are moving through the parameter space. So here I have two parameters in this example, right? So I have two parameters, theta one and theta two, and I move in this parameter space to minimize the cost function f, right? So what are the important properties for gradient-based learning? There are two main properties that are very important to maintain. One is called consistency, and the other is called non-saturation. Let's see what each of them means. Consistency means that the gradient direction should not change very quickly in a very significant way, right? So for example, if my cost function is a line in the parameter, let's say I have two parameters and my cost function is a line, then the gradient direction at this point, right, is the same as the gradient direction at this point. So that means that the gradient is consistent. It doesn't change. Now, this is a good property because when I see the gradient at locally at a certain point, that tells me information about the global properties of the function, uh, of the cost function, right? Because that gradient is the same at every point. So the step I am making is a useful step, right? But an example like an exponential is a bad example. Why is the exponential bad example? Because the gradient direction is not consistent at all, right? So here, if I have a line d by dx, x, the first derivative of x, equal one, right? This one is a constant. But if I take the first derivative of an exponential, that's always an exponential, meaning that the gradient itself is an exponential. The first derivative is an exponential, so it's always changing. Now, this is bad because if I am at a point here, the gradient looks like this, right? So I move in that direction, and then I go to a new point. The gradient is very different, right? So that means that in order to learn efficiently, I have to make the epsilon very small, Right, so that and and the, so that I can always capture the right direction of the gradient because it's moving very quickly. So if the epsilon is is uh, is big, then my move is not efficient. Right, so that will result in very slow training. Right, if the epsilon is small, but here for the line case, I can make the epsilon large because the gradient is not changing. Now the other property is non-saturation. Non-saturation means that the magnitude of the gradient the magnitude of the first of the partial uh, first derivative information should remain significant because if it becomes zero then i don't know where to move 
If it becomes zero at a minimum point or a maximum point, that's a good thing. That's not bad. But if it becomes zero at a point that's not a minimum or a maximum, then that's, that's bad because I don't have a clue about where to move. So imagine, for example, I am here at this point. This is called a flat region. That's a bad, a bad thing to encounter with gradient based learning because let's imagine this function goes in this way. I don't know here while I am at this point. I don't know that I should move in this direction because maybe the function has this property and maybe the function has the property that to the left there is a bigger minimum. At this point in the flat region, I don't know where to move, right? So remember these two properties as we go through consistency with gradient based learning, consistency of the gradient direction. Right? This is a function of the direction or the sign of the gradient. And the other one is non-saturation, meaning that the magnitude should remain significant. So one property is a function of the sign of the gradient. Another property is a sign of the magnitude of the gradient. Thank you.